Dear YouTube viewing audience, What you are about to watch is an attempt by a grown adult man to discuss and analyze an eight-year-old film made for children. That film is entitled Nomeo and Juliet, a 2011 computer animated film distributed by Touchstone Pictures and co-produced by Sir Elton John's personal film studio, which ostensibly exists only to make Elton John related content, yes, even the ones that people seem to like. For this project, I have watched the film multiple times and watched promotional materials showcasing its very famous voice talent doing their damnedest to hype this innocuous project, which will have little to no impact on their larger careers beyond having something to show their very young kids as proof that they do in fact have jobs in motion pictures. It's nice to imagine that all your renomes in your garden have something else, do you know what I mean? They've all got something that they're hiding from you. <laughs> Call me. The protagonists of this film are all traditional garden gnomes. The practice of adorning gardens with small figurines goes back to the Roman Empire, but the first proper garden gnomes date to 1841, when the Dresden-based company Bayer and Marisch kept small ceramic dwarf figurines for sale. The Gardensverge, or Garden Dwarves, spread from Saxony to Thuringia and then to France, and finally to England, where Sir Charles Edmund Isham, 10th Baronet, imported 21 terracotta figurines to his home in Lamport Hall, Northampton, where they were first called gnomes, an alchemical mystical creature first described by Paracelsus in the 16th century, the name possibly derived from the Latin genomos, roughly meaning Earth Dweller. None of this information will enrich your life in any way. The film ceramic protagonist also serves as an aesthetic shortcut, since CGI is expensive and most rendering software can handle porcelain better than human skin, which is why the two human characters, Miss Montague and Mr. Capulet, are always kept obscured. The gnomes are divided into red and blue groups, allowing them to reenact the tragic story of the Crips and the Bloods. That statement was, to the best of my ability, a joke. For this is, in fact, an adaptation of William Shakespeare's The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet, a story which, as the movie admits, has been told before. A lot. A lot. A lot. And now we are going to tell it again, but different. The film admits its shameless rating of the public domain freely, while simultaneously commenting on its generally loose relation to the work. Indeed, the film bears little of the Bard's language, save for scant quotation, Parting is such sweet sorrow. or sly hypertextuality towards the author's greater canon. Ah! Ow! Ow! Damn spot! Over here, boy! In fact, the greater artistic presence in the film's text is not Shakespeare's words, but the musical compositions of Sir Eldon John, whose works are woven throughout the score in quotations ranging from orchestral rearrangement to full pop cover to direct sampling to digitalization. It's a simple strategy of allowing the film to have fun, kid-friendly musical moments, with the economic bonus of not needing to pay for any original songs. This market-tested kid-friendliness also encourages a sense of whimsy and innocence possibly best exemplified by this sequence, where the rival gnome factions compete not through bloody streets washbuckling, but by competitive lawnmower racing set to a lyrically adapted version of Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting. <laughs> One of these races ends in the shattering of Tybalt, resulting in his death, as the character does die in the play. This death is then undone by the end by showing Tybalt alive, though crumbling, yet still able to participate in the film's mandatory dance party epilogue. For you see, dear viewers, unlike the play, which ends with the death of its title characters and an easily avoidable double suicide, the film ends with a big stupid dance party set to Crocodile Rock. This practice of changing a work to suit the needs of middle-class family values is called boulderization, after Thomas Boulder, who in 1818 infamously published The Family Shakespeare, which altered passages and in some cases omitted entire characters to appeal to 19th century morals. For this, boulderize became a verb describing the act of radically altering a text for the purpose of moral censorship. While the film is guilty of boulderization, it admits its guilt through the presence of a statue of William Shakespeare voiced by Sir Patrick Stewart, who summarizes the end of the play succinctly. She feigns her death. Whoa! He finds ah! her, thinks her dead, takes his own life, she wakes, 
finds him dead, takes her life, both dead. Exeunt omnes, the end curtain! This allows the filmmakers to replace it with their own ending. An all-out garden war featuring an overpowered lawnmower voiced by professional wrestler Hulk Hogan. Your lawn will be afraid to grow! Terra Furminator! Oh, no, no! <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think this ending is much better. Sure. Perhaps the lone dramaturgically interesting facet of the film is that through the introduction of the original author as a character, Nomeo and Juliet admits its own tension between being an adaptation of a universally beloved work of theater and being a kid's movie, tension which is solved by openly siding with its market needs. And the result is an aesthetic blandness that sent me into a month-long depression which I spent avoiding writing entirely, instead spending most of my time lying either on my bed or on my couch, trying to beat my high score on 2048, a free game which I've invested years of my life into, a game which I play instinctively for the purpose of distracting my brain from unpleasant thoughts, such as, why did I decide to use my limited time on Earth to make videos in which I pretend to be smart online like every other gormless pseudo-academic jackass on this platform for soulless venture capitalists, empathy-deficient quasi-intellectual grifters, and hopeless multitudes of validation junkies like myself, and in particular, why oh why did such an overwhelming depressing of state have to hit me because of the ludicrous fact that I dedicated my labor to an exegesis of a children's film about garden gnomes. True. Let's go kick some grass. This film is not terrible, nor transcendent. It is, above all, mediocre. The premise is mediocre. The execution is mediocre. Its value, if any, is leaked from more innovative works from more talented artists, and yes, I am including both Sir Elton John and William Shakespeare in that statement. It is a piece of adequate work. It brought some capital to its creators and to its employees. It amused some, and ultimately offended none. And speaking personally, as a professional content creator of nine years, I aspire to such levels of mediocrity. Even in this humble review, cobbled together at the end of a long month of depression and far too many games of 2048, may my creative output be as inoffensive and transient as this. This children's adaptation of a public domain work made by professional creatives struggling to briefly entertain an ineffable viewing public, ever hungry for more content. And so ends this month's offering to the content machine. Let's kick some grass. Sincerely, K. P.S. Yes, I know about the sequel. No, I will not watch it.